Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Ken Phillips. I'm a partner here at uh, Hogan Lovells in Singapore. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this event tonight, uh, at, which is hosted by the CIL and the ILA. And we're very uh, pleased to be able to support these organizations uh, with this particular event. I'm from New Zealand, and, and the most important sport for me, I guess, is, is rugby. We grow up with it. It's a religion. It was an amateur game when, when I grew up, uh, and, and there was not much at stake. Not a great role for the law, a lot of role for, for debate and conjecture. Um, but things have changed uh, since, and we can see in that game alone, we see uh, the stakes are much higher. And sport, generally, the stakes have become much higher, and with it, the, the, the role for law. These are my observations as an international arbitration lawyer with no sports law expertise, uh, but a great deal of affection for the game of rugby. Each of you will have your own experiences and context to share with this really interesting topic. Before I hand over to Anthony to make the introductions, um, I, I would like to, to mention that uh, one of my colleagues was supposed to speak this evening, Kush Vedd. I don't know if Kush has been able to dial in, but he's uh, seriously unwell and has been able, unable to make this event. So he will not be speaking this evening. Uh, that's uh, all been planned and catered for, but uh, just so you know, if you're waiting for Kush's presentation, uh, he, he, he is not able to join us this evening. So um, he apologizes for that. So do we. Um, thank you again for, for joining. We're looking forward to the presentation. Anthony, over to you. Thanks again. Thanks a lot, Ken. Um, as Ken was just mentioning just now, this, this is an event organized by the Singapore branch of the International Law Association and NUS's Center for International Law. Uh, my name is Anthony. I am an international arbitration lawyer. Uh, and I'm glad to be the moderator for today's event, which is entitled, Is the Referee a Good Lawyer? Establishing an International Framework for Professional Sports. Now, apologies, because I'll be having to look both at my present audience here as well as my digital audience back there. So it, it might be a little bit strange, but please, please do bear with us. One of them is bigger than the other. <laughs> That's all we will say. <laughs> it's okay, your type profile is good. <laughs> Thank God for this haircut. <laughs> Best five dollars I ever spent. Uh, so, I mean, if I may be so direct, I, I feel like international sports law, or, or rather like the relationship between international law and professional sports is, is an area which is, is really quite under discussed. I mean, particularly here in Asia. I've been, I've been practicing here for about 12 years, and I think I've been to one event on international sports law. And, and it, it's perhaps a bit surprising, but, but I suspect that that's partially because international law's impact on professional sports is almost, almost hidden in plain view. In, in the sense that we see, for those of us who follow professional sports, we see what happens. We see the teams, the players, the institutions, the competitions. And, and of course, there are a lot of legal issues taking place behind the scenes but we don't really think about them unless we are directly confronted with them. As for myself, I mean, I'm not a sports lawyer, but the first time which I personally felt affected by international law's impact on sports was in the summer of 2013. Uh, I say personal because I really love Arsenal football club and, and their, their actions are personal to me, that sad as that may be. So, so we go to the summer of 2013, where, where Arsenal are trying to sign a striker, this Mr. Luis Suarez of Liverpool at the time. And, and there was a very distinct belief amongst the Arsenal legal team that in his contract, there was a, a clause pursuant to which if a team were to bid over $40 million, that team would have the right to talk to Suarez. So, so at the time, Arsenal make a bid of £40 million pounds plus £40 million and £1. Pounds. And, and of course, that was derided within the media as being, oh, look at these jokers at Arsenal. What are they doing? Why are they you know, only bidding £40 million plus one? And, and at the time, as with many you know, passive sports fans, I thought, oh, that is completely ridiculous. Why, you, know, you want to buy him? Why are you 
only bidding one pound extra. But then I thought from a legal perspective, well, if there's a clause in your contract which says it has to be over 40 million pounds, 40 million plus one kind of satisfies it, right? Um, nonetheless, the, the Liverpool side weren't particularly impressed. The, the owner of Liverpool tweeted, what, 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 did they, what did they think they're smoking at the Emirates? So it wasn't, it didn't go down particularly well. And then ultimately Suarez never joined Arsenal. But, but again, this, this legal issue played to some extent into, I, I believe, his decision never to join, which in turn affected Arsenal's performance on the pitch. A little bit more recently, in the last, let's say, 12 months or so, there, there are lots of headline grabbing stories, which again have a very direct relationship between international law and, and professional sports. I mean, if we take a look at the end of last year's F1, Max Verstappen and Lewis Hamilton, the decision to let Verstappen um, go and, and not you know, have the race sort of um, proceed in, in whatever that term is, um, it directly affected uh, the outcome, meaning that Verstappen won, Lewis Hamilton lost what would have been his eighth F1 um, title. Uh, or, or more recently, the, the international, um, I think that it, it's an association called FINA, which is the, the swimming organization, recently banned transgender athletes from participating. And, and that's in light of the fact that a lady called Leah Thomas made history in the, in the United States as the first transgender woman to win an NCAA swimming championship. Or even more recently, what about Roman Abramovich at Chelsea? Or, or even Russian athletes being banned from international competitions. These are all instances in which international law has a very, very direct effect on practical sports and, and eventually on the outcome of, of these sports. Um, so, so today's webinar is really to explore that framework in a little bit more detail. Um, before I move on to introducing our two wonderful speakers today, um, a couple of housekeeping points. Uh, firstly, for, for the cheeky monkeys amongst you who are just here to, uh, to claim CPD points, um, please, please do remember to sign in and sign out at the end. Uh, secondly, we're going to have uh, a Q&A session at the end. So the members of the audience here, please feel free just to raise your hands. Uh, for our friends watching online, please type your questions into the Q&A section. We'll, we'll take a look at them. We'd be happy to read them out at the end. Uh, third housekeeping point, and I, I don't really want to sound like a YouTuber too much here, but there's lots of great content coming out of the ILA's um, webinar series. So, so please, feel, please, please do keep a look out for, for, for that content. Um, and if and when this video is uploaded on YouTube, please click subscribe, click like, comment below, hashtag AFTV. Um, <clears throat> so our first speaker today is Mr. Pierre Viguet. Pierre is a senior associate in, the, in GBSD, an international law firm based in Paris, um, which specializes in, in international dispute resolution. Um, he's also a very good friend of mine, despite the fact that he supports Paris Saint-Germain, which is an awful, awful, awful club. So without any further ado, um, Pierre, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, indeed, uh, we are we are friends with Anthony, and uh, indeed also we have like uh, competitors. Because of course, yes, my my team is PSG, and his team is Arsenal. Uh, they didn't play a lot together in the last uh, years, but I remember one game that PSG won in the or two games. Okay. Oh no, maybe it was uh, one uh, win and one lose uh, in the Champions League uh, uh, competition in two thousand and eighteen or nineteen. Um, so. Should I start? Should I start, Anthony, now? Yes, please, absolutely. Good. Uh, it's very interesting what uh, what you the, the presentation you made uh, regarding the topic because this is exactly uh, the the situation we have now in in the sports uh, uh, law sports fields. I would I would call it like this. You may heard you may have heard about the notion of Lex Sportiva. Uh, it's uh, and if you don't, of course, you have heard about Lex Mercatoria, and as Lex Mercatoria, Lex Sportiva is very difficult to define what is exactly what is comprised what is uh, comprised of. As there is a big debate, you know what is exactly this Lex Sportiva, and 
and what we heard about uh, Anthony's uh, uh, thoughts, it's exactly that. Um, Lex Sportivas from some people is a synonymous of sports law, uh, meaning that it includes um, every rules regarding sports that are issued by states, by um, uh, private organizations, uh, which are the federation, association, such as the FIFA, the UEFA, uh, the International Olympic Committee, uh, or the case law from a court that you may have heard, the Court of Arbitration for Sports. Uh, and this, the particularity of this, um, of this uh, field of, of sports law is that uh, at the end of the day, uh, a lot of rules are issued not by state entities, but by private entities. Um, as I said, we have uh, many examples in international uh, entities. We are very often located in, in Switzerland, uh, like the IOC, like the FIFA, like UEFA, or other federation or Olympic uh, uh, committees. And, um, but with the development of sport, a professional sport, these rules, as uh, Anthony emphas emphasized, um, can become mandatory and have a big impact on the career of the athletes, on the story and of the legend of some clubs. Um, and uh, that's why they are taking, have now a so big impact and importance. So regarding the definition of Lex Sportiva, there is a kind of uh, consensus of what exactly may, it may be. At least it is a sports league, there is a sports legal order into which, into this legal order, you have transnational regulations adopted by the sports organizations, which are considered as a real rule of law. And this rule of law are mandatory for the athletes or the teams or other uh, entities uh, in the context of the professional activities. And the Lex Sportiva, of course, includes the Court of Arbitration for Sports case law, since the CAS uh, deals with the disputes in relation with uh, such rules. So let me just give, give you three examples of what are some principles of Lex Sportiva, which are really uh, particular for sports. Uh, the first principle, uh, which has been confirmed by CAS, is the principle nulla pena sine lege, which means that sanctions cannot be imposed to athletes or teams unless there is a violation of a rule and unless sanctions are provided for in the rule. And I will give you a very simple example. You all know the, the World Anti-Doping uh, Code. I, according to Article 1, uh, what is a violation of this code, of this code is a, 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 a doping is defined as a violation of the anti-doping rules. So the anti-doping rules has to be provided and the sanction has to be provided. If an athlete takes a product or use a product that is not prohibited, it will not be uh, imposed uh, any uh, sanction on him. Another principle uh, from the Lex Sportiva is called the strict liability. Strict liability can, liability can be seen in two kinds of situations. One is the strict liability of the football clubs, for example, for their supporters' misconduct. It means that if it appears that the supporters like Anthony is like uh, uh, behaving and uh, misconducting uh, nearby the Emirates Stadium in London, Arsenal will be uh, subject to disciplinary measures. And, um, and even if, even if uh, uh, um, I would say better, unless Arsenal would prove that he had made everything possible to prevent this situation which is very, very, very rare, of course. Another strict liability responsibility is strict liability for the athletes in doping cases, meaning that if it is established that the athletes violated the anti-doping rules, the athlete is automatically disqualified irrespective of its mens rea, uh, its real intention, in order to preserve the integrity of sports competition. So you see that I don't know that case, the case, the case law of CAS is very important in this uh, uh, growing of uh, uh, international sports law framework. So very briefly, I would like you to present, uh, to present you uh, the, the, the court of arbitration, of arbitration for sports, uh, very briefly. Uh, first, and this is obvious, the, the CAS is not a court of justice. 
meaning that it's an arbitral institution with its seats in Lausanne, meaning that the, any challenge of the award will be uh, brought before the Swiss Federal uh, Tribunal. And the CAS constitute arbitral tribunals or calls panels for resolving disputes arising in the context of sports. In other words, the awards are rendered on the basis of the CAS procedural rules and not by the CAS itself. In practice, what do the CAS? It's providing the necessary infrastructure and ensures that the proceedings are conducted with efficiency. So why the CAS has been created? Why have, have we this, this, this uh, arbitrary institution today? Well, we have to, uh, to, 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 to travel back uh, in the past, in the 80s, uh, when the president of the International Olympic uh, Committee, Ran Antonio, Antonio Samaranch, uh, faced a situation where um, some people uh, challenged the decision of IOC before state courts. And it was particularly true in the situation where um, Taiwan, uh, that the People's Republic of China substituted Taiwan uh, at the United Nations and also in the, in the IOC uh, institution. Because the Taiwan uh, representative of the IOC challenged the decision before Swiss courts, Antonio, Juan Antonio Samaranch was really, really upset. He wanted to have all the disputes related to sports and of course related to the IOC settled into the family in order to, to, to prevent any challenge before state courts. So he to, to reach this purpose, he called his friend, a judge at the, uh, at the ICJ, uh, the judge came by and by, and he told him, well, uh, I would like to have an international court of justice, but for sports. Meaning that this institution would render definitive decisions and which would not be uh, challengeable before uh, the, the state courts. And as you imagine, judge came by by replied to uh, Juan Antonio Samaranch that it was not possible because IOC is not a state and cannot uh, oblige a party or an athlete to, uh, to not go to before uh, state courts. So you are arbit maybe arbitration lawyers and you know that there is an alternative, a solution to this issue. And this is what judges came by proposed to, uh, to, uh, to uh, run onto the summer, was the, to create an arbitral institution. Indeed, by consented to arbitration, athletes, teams of federation are prevented to go to state courts at first, uh, based on the principle of competence, competence that we, uh, we, we all know. So Juan Antonio Samaras accepted the proposition and then the judge came by and by, um, created the CAS, the statutes of the CAS uh, were operative in uh, 1984. And then uh, the IOC made its best to obtain the consent of all the federation in order for them to introduce the arbitration clause in their statutes like this, when the athletes will take the license to the federation, it will consent to the arbitration clause provided in the statutes. And if there is, if there would be a, a dispute regarding a decision rendered by the federation or in relation with the competition, the athletes or the clubs would be obliged to go before CAS and to, uh, to proceed by arbitration and will be prevented to present this case uh, before uh, the state courts. So um, this was in 1984. Uh, there, will be, there was a big job made by IOC and the judge came by in order to obtain the consent of uh, as much as possible federations. Uh, FIFA and UEFA were the, among the last ones to accept uh, this consent uh, in uh, 2004. And in the exchange of the consent, FIFA obtained that the, the CAS has a specific list of arbitrators for football disputes. So today, what I always organize today, the, the CAS, uh, there are three uh, permanent division. Uh, the first division is the ordinary arbitration division, which is with every uh, disputes uh, related to sports, but uh, in, uh, in relation with contracts or in commercial disputes. Can be sponsorship, can be dispute between an agent and, um, and a club or a player. Um, so it, it's, it's, it just needs to be related to sports and to have an arbitration clause. And uh, you can bring this, uh, this dispute uh, uh, before the, 
the a, a panel constituted by the, arbit the ordinary arbitration decision division. But the, the specificity of CAS has been the creation of the appeals arbitration division. This division constitutes tribunal whose responsibility is to resolve disputes concerning the decisions of federations, associations, or other sports-related bodies insofar as the dispute the statutes or regulations of the said sports-related bodies or a specific agreement so provide, and if the appellant has exhausted the legal remedies available to a prior uh, to it prior to the appeal, meaning that if you have a decision taken by a federation against a player, an athlete, the athlete has first to go to each step into uh, the federation to challenge the decision, and at the end, at the end, uh, if there is an ambition clause in the statute or in his license, etc., he can appeal the decision before CAS. Uh, it will be a de novo um, uh, review of the case. Uh, meaning that the, 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 the arbitrators will review the case from the very beginning without, irrespective of the decision of the, the, the federation. And, and then the award, which will be rendered, uh, will be challenged before the Swiss Federal Tribunal. Uh, this is the big uh, uh, creativity uh, and the innovation of the, of the case. And since January 2019, there is now an anti-doping division which has been established to hear and decide anti-doping case as a first instance authority uh, pursuant to a delegation of power from uh, the IOC or International Federation, etc. So for many, it's, it happens that some federation or organization have not the, or prefer to give to uh, this institution, this division, uh, the role to, to set the dispute related to, um, to doping. And there are also uh, ad hoc uh, divisions of uh, CAS, which, which are uh, created for each edition of the Olympic Summer or Winter Games, uh, the Commonwealth Games, uh, the UEFA European Championship, or the FIFA World Cup. You have an example of the, of the, the purpose, the mission of these ad hoc divisions is to settle finally and within a maximum of 40, 24 hours any dispute arising during the competitions. And you have an example of the last um, uh, Winter Olympic Games in Beijing uh, with the Kamila Valieva case, the Russian uh, um, skater, as we should say, that uh, uh, was, uh, uh, I mean, accused of uh, doping. And in less than 40 hours, the ad hoc and, and panel constituted by the ad hoc division of the CAS uh, decided to, um, to suspend the decision. So another specificity of uh, CAS is that uh, the parties have to choose the arbitrators on a close list. Uh, this is, according to CAS, uh, the best way to settle sport disputes. It's to uh, have specialists of the field um, dealing with these uh, issues. Uh, so the list of arbitrators uh, is constituted by a specific institution called the International Council of Arbitration for Sports, which is just above the CAS. And we, the role of this ICAS is to, uh, super, to ensure the independence of the CAS, uh, to administrate, to ensure the financing of the CAS, and constitutes the list of arbitrators that can be appointed uh, in the CAS tribunal. So in order to be on this list, uh, the candidates must have appropriate uh, legal training, uh, be rec have recognized competence with regard to sports law and or international arbitration, a good knowledge of sport in general, and a good comment of at least one of CAS working language, which are today English, French, and since 2021, Spanish. Why Spanish is now... Um, um, uh, uh, working language at CAS is because there are a lot of disputes arising from uh, South America, uh, teams and athletes, um, which uh, um, have <laughs> give a lot of work to, uh, to CAS nowadays. Uh, on the list of uh, the, the CAS, the closed list, there are today 426 names. And there are, I have, I have, I checked the website, and there are actually six Singapore nationals that I will um, call because I guess it's important for you to know. 
so there are Dr. Michael Wong, that we all know, of course, uh, Mr. Bala Chandran Kandia, Professor Peter Ko, Mr. Michael Palmer, Mr. Chalva Raja Essi, and Mr. Paul A. G. Supramaniam. When CAS arbitrators uh, are on the list, uh, they may not act as counsel. So you have to choose, or you are an arbitrator, or you act as counsel before CAS. Uh, this, rule, this rule was introduced because uh, before 2010, um, it happened that uh, arbitrators of CAS had information about CAS uh, case law uh, or organization, etc., that the other council didn't have. So to ensure the equality between the parties, they decided to really restrict the role, uh, divide the role of council and arbitrator. And since 2021, uh, the, the CAS arbitrators cannot appear as expert um, before the CAS. So um, the, the, we have seen that the, the big particularity of CAS is this um, appeal arbitration procedure. And I would like just to, to, to go through the big specificity of this procedure. Uh, first, as uh, of course, see the consent of the athletes is not sometimes very, um, need, as since the consent, the consent of the, the, of the, the, the athletes is not sometimes very uh, clear. And um, CAS ensures that in the case of appeal against decision, which are exclusively of disciplinary nature, not pecuniary, but disciplinary nature, and are rendered by international federation or sports body, the proceedings is free for the athletes. So fees and costs of arbitrators are supported by CAS. However, each party of course will bear uh, the cost of, his, of their witnesses, experts or interpreters. The time limits to, uh, to appeal a decision before CAS is limited because, of course, we need to settle the, dis the dispute very quickly. So at maximum, it would be 21 days from the receipt of the decision uh, appealed against uh, before CAS. Uh, the time can be shortened, uh, like for UFI, I guess it's 10 days, uh, or in can situation can be longer. Uh, the president of the division, of the appeal division, will appoint the sole arbitrator, if there is only one arbitrator, or the president of the tribunal, as there are three arbitrators. So there are, there are a kind of uh, overview of the, um, the president of the division. And since the 1st January 2019, at the request of a physical person, uh, a public hearing should be held in the matter of a disciplinary nature. This rule has been adopting following the decision of the European Court of Human Rights in the famous Mutu and Pechtan case. And I will conclude with this case because it's in relation with the Lex Sportiva and, um, and uh, the importance, the impact of sports law now uh, uh, today in, in our world. In this case, uh, briefly, it was in concern um, a German national, Claudius Pechtan, who was a professional speed skater. Um, she was imposed a two-year ban uh, for doping, and this decision was confirmed by the CAS. Uh, and if, despite uh, of Claudia Spetsan's request for the hearing uh, to be public, CAS decided to hold the hearing in camera. The second uh, party was Mr. Adrian Mutu, a Romanian football, professional football player who was tested positive for cocaine when he was playing for Chelsea. And uh, Chelsea decided to terminate uh, his employment contract with immediate effect. And he was also suspended. And Mr. Mutu was ordered by the CAS to pay 17.1 uh, million euro to Chelsea uh, due to his behavior. So both the worlds were challenged before the Swiss Federal Tribunal, but the appeals were dismissed. So Ms. Pechstein and Mr. Mutu challenged the decision before the European Court of Human Rights on different grounds, and I will just focus off, uh, on one. The court found that there was a violation of Article 6.1 of the Convention, which is related to the right of a free or the fair trial, on, the, on account of the fact that the proceedings before the case were not held in public for Mrs. Pechstein. What the court uh, decided, fact, analyze first is that there are like two kinds of arbitration. You have the voluntary arbitration and you have the compulsory arbitration. What is 
a compulsory arbitration is when you have arbitration required by law, meaning that the parties have no option but to refer the dispute to an arbitral tribunal. And in this case, uh, the tribunal must offer the safeguards secured by Article 6.1 of the European uh, uh, Convention of Human Rights. But if it's a voluntary arbitration, so if the consent is given freely, um, the party can uh, waive their rights provided secured by the convention. Uh, at the condition, of course, that the consent is freely given, lawful, and in an inequivocal manner. In our case, in the case of Mrs. Pechstein, the court considered that uh, the, there was the, the, uh, the applicable rules of its federation provided for the compulsory jurisdiction of the CAS in respect of the disputes at case. It was a disciplinary proceeding. And the court observes that the only choice in Mrs. Penshaw's case was between accepting the arbitration clause and, then, and thus earning her living by practicing her sport professionally or not accepting it and being obliged to uh, refrain completely from earning a living from her sport at that level. So at the end of the day, it was a compulsory arbitration. But as I said before, compulsory arbitration is only if it is required by law. Here in this case, it was not required by law. It was required by the statutes of its federation. And what the, the court concludes is that even though it had not been imposed by law, but by the Federation regulations, the acceptance of CAP jurisdiction by Mrs. Pechang should be regarded as compulsory arbitration within the meaning of its case law. Therefore, the arbitration proceedings should have been offered the safeguards secured by Article 6.1 of the Convention. What it means is that the regulation of the Federation um, is equal to law from state's law. So it means that there is a legal order, sports legal order with regulation, which are mandatory to some athletes or teams in their professional activity. Uh, so it's a recognition of this legal order, of this sports legal order and the impact and the importance of this sports legal order at that level. And you may have known that, the, that the, 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 so far, uh, the public hearing uh, uh, can be held before a uh, CAS. And the first example uh, in recent year was in October 2019 when the, the swimmer, Mr. Sun Yang, um, who was contesting uh, the decision of the FINA um, and the World Anti-Doping case uh, to, uh, to, uh, to be suspended because of doping. Um, I guess I'm done, uh, Anthony. I will let the floor to, to uh, go. Yeah, that, that, thanks a lot, Pierre. I mean, I, w one of the things which I find very interesting in, in your presentation is, is understanding a little bit more about how CAS works and, and how it differs from commercial arbitration, which a lot of us are a lot more um, familiar with. The, the point about no double hatting, for example, is something I had no idea about. And you know, it, it's often leveled at, at commercial and, and investment arbitrators. Um, this issue of double hatting and also short, mandatory shorter tr timelines, uh, additional transparency. Um, and, and I've got a question about uh, the, the Pechstein case, but I'll leave that till, till later on. Um, and and I'll, I'll, I'll let our second speaker take the floor. Uh, we have Miss Miss Guo Chai. Uh, Guo is uh, a dedicated sports lawyer. Once upon a time, she, she used to be an international arbitration lawyer. Um, uh, but but I think her, her practice has now evolved into to more general sports law. She, she's based in China. Um, I don't know what her favorite football team is, but I, I'm sure she'll enlighten us very soon on that. Um, so, Guo, we'll over to you. Um, thanks, Anthony. And um, thanks, everyone, for having me here. Um, so, I, I, have, I have a few, like, follow-up feedbacks to um, PF's presentation just now. Um, so he talked about uh, Peshtan case, which is quite uh, well known, uh, a ECHR jurisprudence. And I think it's like the Sun Yang case, like every person dedicated to sports will study this jurisprudence. And I was so amazed to find that Peshtan, Mrs. Peshtan was still active in sport. And she's actually the oldest 
um, athlete appearing in the Beijing Olympics Winter Games in 2022 this year. So I, I discovered her on the TV screen and I said, wow, this is Peshton. Is that the same Peshton uh, appearing on the ECHR case? And that, that's exactly the case. So I think the, the case has been long left. It's a past chapter for her and she still practices the sports and she um, even became a role model, um, uh, aside from having that case um, continuing. And um, um, I, I think when I just learned about he, her case, uh, she fought all the way to German um, courts, to the Swiss Federal Tribunal, and then all the way to ECHR. It was a bit unbelievable for me when I first uh, read about her trajectory of the case. But um, after I uh, studied and also uh, pick up the practice of sports law, I totally understood her because sometimes um, I think as sports practitioner, we got very frustrated as kind of stuck in a system. So I actually recently have a case that we are planning to take it to the ECHR as well. And so, so I can now uh, totally relate to, um, you know, some athletes and um, even some, some parties, some federation or football clubs that find themselves can, um, suffering from, they feel like injustice in the system. So I think um, probably my, uh, my introduction or my presentation to you will be from a more critical perspective Perspective, uh, on top of Pierre's um, introduction of the system of what it is. Um, so for me, I um, so so Anthony says that I, I was once upon a time an international arbitration lawyer, but actually I'm always an international arbitration lawyer. But just right now, because I um, in 2008 I was a volunteer for the Beijing Olympics. Uh, which started my um, my journey in sports. And then around 2015 and 2016, I was a colleague uh, with Anthony in Sherman Singapore office. And so he probably doesn't know while I was uh, seemingly kind of working on those commercial arbitration cases, I was secretly contemplating or planning in my mind that um, I, I wanted to do sports. So uh, that's how I started. And so I, I think right after the Rio Olympics in 2016, I started to gradually uh, pick up sports practice and now it became a very large part of my practice. Uh, uh, I, I mentioned about this because I wanted to let you know that uh, there is no very um, clear cut um, like um, uh, a line between commercial arbitration, sports arbitration. Um, I actually find that my background and my training as a commercial uh, arbitration lawyer uh, at the start of my, my practice benefited significantly my practice as a sports professional, sports law professional. Um, so, um, and I can give you some example um, about it. Um, and I will pick of the football uh, dispute res resolution because um, you know uh, FIFA is um, um, I think it's the uh, undisp uh, it's undisputed um, the uh, the most powerful international federation in the world and over the years by establishing the very sophisticated rules and also internal dispute resolution mechanisms. Um, inside FIFA, um, I think FIFA already managed to create, um, uh, you could say, a football kingdom, which has its own uh, legal order uh, that was supported by the jurisprudence of CAS and uh, football uh, and FIFA itself, as well as Swiss Federal Tribunal. And I asked the Center for International Law to circulate a judgment I recently got from um, the People's Court in China uh, that, um, that is about a football case, which I think um, uh, it's a very vivid illustration of how um, this uh, football dispute resolution mechanism overlaps with and interacts with the uh, commercial arbitration as well as the judicial courts and national courts. So, um, so this case is actually uh, very interesting and uh, typical. Um, so it uh, it's a it's a uh, it's a it's about a football coach uh, trying to implement a FIFA decision. It got um, it's a standard uh, document, just two or three pages, uh, saying that uh, you uh, you won the case against the. Um, uh, against a, a certain football club and they are ordered to pay you certain amount by certain date. 
So um, everything seems very well uh, and typical, but unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, several months before FIFA renders that decision, and actually also at the time when he tries to implement that decision, the football club unfortunately got um, uh, out of football circle, which means that it got dissolved because uh, they lacked funding. So it no longer registered with the Football Association in China. Um, so indirectly, the uh, FIFA mechanism doesn't work for it. So normally, um, FIFA mechanism or the uh, decisions um, ordered by the internal mechanism of FIFA um, internal organs are very effective because you do not have to go through the judicial courts or New York Convention trying to enforce a decision by FIFA ordering a club or football association to pay a coach or a player. You um, So um, this, this power actually comes from um, the threats of sanctions. So if the football club does not pay him, pay the pay the coach by certain date, then um, they, they will th threaten you with certain sanction like a, a, a transfer ban or um, deduction of points or relegation of divisions. So if the football club still wants to play in pro professional football and it still wants to, ha it has a big dream to go far, then um, it usually will comply with the football de uh, the decision by FIFA, even though grudgingly and even though they disagree uh, significantly with how, um, how the result it is and uh, maybe the quality of the reasoning whatsoever. But um, we re uh, usually face and increasingly, I think, especially against the back uh, backdrop of uh, a pandemic and economic slowdown, a lot of football clubs uh, became dissolved because they do not have enough money and they do not have this um, big dream anymore. Um, so uh, I could tell you, like, I think in the year of 2020, we have about 16 professional football clubs in all three professional divisions of Chinese football that drop out. So um, you got such a common problem that these uh, players and coaches, they do have a creditor's rights, very solid creditor's rights against these kind of football clubs. But um, these clubs um, disappeared. They just dissolved, so you you have nobody to sue. But in my case, it's actually very uh, particular because even though the football club um, dropped out, but the legal entity operating the football club still exists. And you know what? It it changed to a dining services company, so it still exists legally. And uh, in theory, we could still sue it, but. Um, but 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 the football mechanism or FIFA mechanism no longer works. Um, so I even met the legal representative of this dining services company, the formerly the the football club, and he told me that he acknowledged the debts and no problem, and he even offered us a pocket money for settlement. But come and sue me. This is what he told us that because he knows that uh, you know we have no way to to enforce anything. Um, and it would be very difficult. So what we do is that uh, like Peshkin and like all those football players who like pursue their rights relentlessly, um, my, my client and I, we, we determined that uh, we should try because we believe that we're on the right side. So we refused to settle and we took the case to the court and sue the, the dining services company plus the legal the statutory representative. And it, it is a very, very difficult process uh, because um, I think this coach, um, the claimant, he encountered a very common problem in China. And I don't know whether it's the same in Singapore, but probably if you um, try those cases, you um, in the first few cases, you will encounter the similar problem. So that is something I called in one publication I, I made um, with Jeff Pence that we say that this is the jurisdictional vacuum, which means that, um, you know, in this circumstance where the football club dissolved and uh, when the players or the coaches try to uh, pursue the rights against the, 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 the data, then um, they, they fell into a jurisdictional vacuum because nobody wants to take their case. Uh, so, so, so they go to the football association trying to implement the FIFA decision. Um, the football association, association says, "Sorry, uh, you can't come to us because um, 
um, you are, you know, the, the, the data or the respondent is no longer governed by football rules. So sorry, uh, we, we can't help you. And then if you go to those labor trial tribunal and they will say, hey, this is not, a, this is a football uh, dispute, not a labor dispute, then please go away. So we were turned away like twice. And then the last resort, the last resort is really just the, the judicial courts. We call it people's court in China. And I think that's also a very painful experience because uh, uh, me personally, I go to the local courts for several times, just trying to lodge the claim because usually you, you got a judge uh, as a gatekeeper, he, he will tell you that, uh, hey, you have a arbitration clause. Are you a lawyer? Uh, if you're a lawyer, you should know the fundamental arbitration excludes litigation. Yes, I know, but um, so, so, but the, the, um, I think that the problem lies in the fact that um, the, the judicial courts in China and probably in also in other parts of Asia, they are not very familiar with the uh, uh, sports mechanism or football mechanism. So when they see those template clauses referring to uh, any disputes arising in connection with this dispute, we'll have to go to, uh, for example, it's called uh, FIFA um, Dispute Resolution Committee, or sometimes for a Chinese player, the template will say any disputes will have to go to um, the, the arbitration committee within Chinese Football Association. Then the judges will say this is the arbitration clause and then so you, you can't sue here. Uh, but what, what I want to tell you is that um, there is a lot of confusing, confusing terms in the football mechanism that poses problem for the parties. For example, um, we it's well recognized or universally recognized now by CAS jurisprudence, by FIFA itself, and also by the Swiss Supreme Court that uh, the internal organs of FIFA is not arbitration committee or arbitration tribunal. But you know what? The uh, uh, FIFA called its own decision maker in this um, internal organ, called, called them judges. They say it's a single judge of player status committee or single judge of a dispute resolution committee. So when you translate it to Chinese, literally it means fa guan. So that, that is really confusing for the, the real judges in China. So they feel like, okay, th there is another judge um, uh, that, that should uh, decide your dispute. So it's a uh, none of people's court business. And then also in, uh, within Chinese Football Association, the dispute resolution organ is even named as arbitration committee, but it's actually not real arbitral tribunal. So this is quite confusing, uh, which um, uh, actually closed the door, the judicial door for the parties to trying to enforce their rights. Um, so we we tried and for many times, and then because of some particularity of this case, uh, which is foreign related, uh, which does refer to CAS at certain point. So it's regarded as a foreign related arbitration case in the Chinese judicial system. So it has to go all the way from the local courts to the intermediate people's court to the high court and then to the Supreme People's Court. And um, so recently we got this decision, which um, I circulated and uh, I could tell you that represents on the legal standpoint by the Supreme Court of People's Court, uh, Supreme People's Court in, in China. And even though the judgment itself is quite concise, it's only about like uh, seven or eight pages, but um, I could tell you that um, the, the judges in the Supreme People's Court really take, it, take care of it seriously because this is the first sports cases they're handling. So um, they actually, made a lot of extensive research into FIFA statutes and uh, PSC and, and also Swiss Federal Tribunal decision. They even asked for um, past decision on certain on similar issues. And they even organized experts consultation just to discuss the legal points there. So the final conclusion they made um, as um, I circulated and then translated, and you could see that um, I think the essential point is that um, they conclude that the FIFA um, internal organ or any internal organ, uh, internal organ, either it, it's named as arbit arbit arbitration committee or something else, or even they call themselves as judge, 
um, but if they if they are established within the International Federation, it does not con constitute arbitration, real arbitration procedure under the New York Convention. Thus, the decision by an international federation like FIFA's internal body does not amount to an arbitral award that could be recognized or enforced under the New York Convention. So, um, so I think that the, the pretext or, or the implication of this important conclusion is that um, um, even the reference to FIFA or the Chinese Football Association, the template clauses in players or the coaches contract here does not by itself exclude the judicial courts or national court jurisdiction, even though um, of course, we may have to face sanction from FIFA if you decide to take the, the, the dispute to court. But that is from the perspective of FIFA. If you want to sanction, then be it. But it doesn't affect the national court judges, um, their standpoint that they should uh, protect and ensure parties' right to sue. Um, so um, I think uh, even though that this legal point is not um, very new, at international level, because um, uh, because um, I think it has been long and widely established at CAS, FIFA, and the Swiss Federal Tribunal that the internal organs of FIFA does not um, uh, amount to real arbitration. But I think it's still very important for for the national court, especially the Supreme Court, for each jurisdiction to have a certain attitude pronounced in this regard, because at the end of the day, if a player or a coach or another party wants to enforce their rights, then uh, they will have, uh, and, and, and when the football mechanism sometimes doesn't work, um, in the event that uh, you know somebody dropped out of the competition or the football club dissolved or bankrupt, then the last re resort still lies in the judicial court. You will still rely on your national court to protect you as a party. So I think it's still very important for, for the national court in each jurisdiction to give their standpoint. So I think that's a quite, in, um, quite interesting case, uh, very typical. But um, it actually uh, analyzed very comprehensively about the interaction between the uh, New York Convention in commercial arbitration and the football mechanism, as well as the uh, um, like. Uh, you know, there is uh, also an implied appeal rights to 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 cast. So uh, before I pass my floor back to Anthony, I still wanted to. Uh, I wanted to draw a few closing remarks about um, um, how commercial practitioners can get involved in sports. I actually would urge and encourage and uh, advocate for more uh, practitioners in commercial arbitration, commercial dispute resolution to join the sports practice because I find there are a few problems um, as I practice in this area. So first of all, I find that uh, basically my, my, my training in arbitration uh, benefit myself a lot in um, practicing sports law because then you can see through the issues very clearly um, and you understand the fundamental theories of arbitration. So, um, you know, those distinction between commercial arbitration, football mechanism, or, um, and also national court jurisdiction, um, it's all very natural and it's easy for me to, uh, to, to clarify and also engage with the judges. But I find it's not always the case with people who practice sports in the beginning um, without any um, training or, or basics in, in arbitration fundamental theory. So I would urge people who have training in commercial arbitration ex and also experience in commercial arbitration to join in and you will find that actually you are well ahead of uh, people who only do sports. And I think the, the, the eyesight is actually wider than people who limit themselves as um, in, in sport. So this leads to the second issue that I observe in, in the uh, world of sport, because I find that uh, 
maybe it's because of the the lack of people involved in sports so the um so the the list as the peer just um mentioned the list of cast uh, arbitrator is a closed one and um, um and i think the choice is uh, even though it, it's oh, it's okay so there are a lot of people but it's still limited and i think the quality is not necessarily guaranteed and for more often than not i find these people um uh, like immersed themselves uh, or entrenched themselves in sport um, are actually institutionalized, I would say uh, that word. Um, so because, um, you know, these, um, because of the limited participant in this system, then um, they usually wear multiple, multiple hats, at least three hats. Uh, so for example, in a recent case, I have before CAS, I have this arbitrator. On one hand, he's a practitioner in football dispute, and he was even running a database uh, kind of charging certain fees for, um, you know, for researching dispute resolution chambers jurisprudence or FIFA. And then he's a cast arbitrator in charge of football cases. And in my case, uh, so he was sitting on the appeal level, deciding on football cases, uh, interpreting the football regulation, extra, extra. And then recently, I think around, around the time when our award was issued, I, I actually, uh, I also find that uh, he was uh, he was appointed as a FIFA dispute resolution chamber chairperson. So and he got an annual compensation of like one hundred sixty thousand US dollar annually from FIFA. So um, I think there is a very um, rampant complex conflicts of interest in um, in in this area. So I think uh, the way to improve uh, sports. Um, sports circle, sports, um, sports law industries to have more commercial arbitrator, commercial uh, practitioner joining in. Um, so um, yeah, I feel like my time is has ha, is um, is up. So thank you for your patience and for listening to me. Thank you very very much, Guo. I mean, I, I find it quite strange to hear about um, jurisdictional vacuums. I mean, I, I think most commercial arbitration practitioners usually encounter too many bodies trying to exercise jurisdiction, as opposed to no one wanting to do so. So that, that's quite refreshing. Um, I, I think now is the time where we can move on to the Q&A section. Um, we, we have certainly some questions online. Um, I've also got one or two. So, I mean, well, we, we can start with a comment by Tongo Leo, which is that the music was quite strange at the beginning. I mean, the alternative was for me to sing and that would be even worse. But, um, one of the first questions we have is from Gabriel Femi Adewala, um, and, and Gabriel's asking, uh, Will your professional arbitration tra trajectory is quite familiar. Could you share with us how you got some of your first um, arbitration mandates? Let, let's, let's examine the sports side. How did you get the first you know, one or two sports cases? And, and the same question will go out to, um, to Pierre as well. How did you guys get your, your first you know, professional sports cases? Uh, does uh, Pierre, do you want to go first? No, please go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I would be very happy to share my very unusual trajectory because as uh, I just mentioned that um, um, I was uh, working for Sherman uh, when I was um, uh, when I was doing commercial arbitration. But then um, I decided that, um, you know, if I do not start my sports dream, I would never, I would never be able to do it. So, um, so I can share you some tips. I don't know whether um, it works right now because I, I started a few years ago, like about four years ago. Um, but so what I did is that at that time, you know, um, the uh, sometimes you you when you want to start a new new practice, and at that time I was just associate. I have no experience at all regarding um, business development, this type of thing. So what I can do is that uh, first of all is to try to follow. The, um, the the current issues in sport. So what I followed at that time is the 2016 Rio Olympics. And, and there is indeed an interesting case regarding uh, uh, a Chinese swimmer uh, uh, who is a minor at that time and got a key. And she, I think her case is the first one registered in the uh, anti-doping division mentioned by PF. So um, I think that was, um, uh, so I was, uh, it, it was a, 
a live case for me to monitor and also study the rule. And then I um, also attended some sports events and trying to know some people. But I, but I think, um, you know, this is not a very typical uh, or guaranteed a trajectory to get cases, you know, if you go, just go to a competition and got to know somebody who was organizing the event. But uh, I think if you um, are really passionate, um, you could, uh, I think I would encourage anyone who is passionate just to go to the uh, competition or the matches uh, that you're passionate about and try to know some people and you can offer them like a pro bono services for some time. So after, if, if indeed opportunity arise and they give you some pro bono opportunity and you prove that you're valuable, then um, they might become your first client and they are willing to pay your fee. And also I, can, I find that it's very important in the field of sport and I, I suppose Pierre who will concur with me that uh, it's a very small circle compared to commercial arbitration, uh, but also quite uh, closed as well. So it's quite important for um, new people to just um, you know offer themselves to the to the events like networking events. So um, right now, I think I haven't been aboard for about three years due to the pandemic. So a lot of my contacts were actually established in 2018 and 2019 when I was able to travel abroad and attended some networking session or arbitration uh, a sports arbitration seminar. And uh, uh, through those events, I got to know some people and sometimes foreign attorney, they need a local attorney, like a Chinese attorney or Singaporean attorney or Malaysian attorney to assist them in their cases. So I started small and I can tell you that uh, the judgments um, uh, that I circulated is, uh, is from actually um, a colleague I met. Uh, in in Lausanne in a, in the CAS arbitration sports arbitration seminar, it's a very small case, and I thought it was a very simple case when I started, but it turned out very complicated, and um, I I actually appreciate it. I didn't really uh, get uh, well compensated for this simple case, but um, I think I learned very uh, I learned extensively from research and trying to get the case resolved. So yeah, so I think uh, my experience would be uh, go to those events, trying to know people, uh, start from maybe pro bono services, and then also actively join the either in-person or virtual um, seminar, webinar, and I do get a few mandates uh, just, just uh, you know, when the, the, the appointing clients or the, or the attorney says that, uh, they, they saw me feel, they feel like they, they need a counsel and you seem to be reasonable, something like that. It's so, so it's quite, quite strange, but uh, it's, it's useful. And Pierre, what about yourself? Um, hello. The, the go, uh, try to go uh, uh, where to get it. It's uh, it's uh, very impressive, and uh, but uh, there is no. Fun. I mean, there is uh, some. Uh, one of my mentors uh, told me one day that there is not one way to uh, to uh, to uh, to reach the, the the dream or the point you want to uh, to reach. So, uh, first of all, you need to be passionate about what you do, and of course, if you're passionate by sports. Um, it will be end by law. Uh, you will really enjoy yourself uh, in this field. Um, from my side, I said, Anthony, I'm, I'm a big sports fan. I'm a big football fan uh, for years. And um, and uh, I'm, I'm tending, uh, well, I wanted to become a football player at the end of the day. And because I was very bad, no skills at all. No injury, huh? just no skill. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, um, I, uh, I decided to become a lawyer. And after a few years of experience, after eight years experience in Sherman, um, I decided to, uh, that I wanted to, to just join my passion for law and arbitration and sports. And uh, I discussed with my partner at the time, uh, Emmanuel Gaillard and uh, Enyas Banifatemi. And uh, knowing my passion for sport, because as Anthony can witness, my office was full of the jerseys, scarves, etc. Uh, like a museum, like a room, like a boys' room, clearly. So they told me, guys, of course, I mean, it's obvious, go for it. Um, so my first thing was that, yes, I said, go, it's, uh, it's, 
it's a close world. Uh, everybody knows each other, and uh, and uh, I felt that I needed to go back to school to learn about what was possible because it's not because you're a big supporter or you love sports that you know what is possible. So um, I went back to university in France. I attended a one-year course, and then I attended the the UEFA football law program. Uh, which is a fantastic program offered and open to everyone, even if you're not working in a, in a, in a federation or, or um, an association or what. Uh, it's, it's four weeks, uh, intensive four weeks of um, divided, of course, um, and, and focus on specific topics. And you meet a lot of people uh, around the world, fantastic people. Um, so it, it was it had been a very, very uh, good experience. Um, and after that, I, uh, I applied to, uh, to, and I am now a pro bono counsel of the, at the UFA. Uh, and, uh, and we start having some cases in the, in the firm, uh, especially in the sports related disputes, not really direct sports arbitration, like, uh, appeal, uh, against, uh, decision from association federation, but, um, commercial disputes with sports background. Um, uh, and we have a case in, in where we are opposing the, the CAF, the Confederation African de Football, uh, in against uh, the Lagarde company, and uh, and another and other few cases like this. So um, at the end of the day, uh, of course, as I said, go attending conferences, um, uh, participate to moot. There is sports arbitration moot that has been created last year. Um, uh, which is organized by, uh, by some friends and supported by FIFA. Uh, it's a good experience as well. But what, again, the most important, I think, is that you, you love it. If you love it, you will find, I mean, you will, you will dive into deep waters because in sports law, it's amazing. There are a lot of issues, different issues. It's really much complicated that it seems like this. And because it's complicated, it's very funny. So uh, should you like that, go for it, for sure. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Um, are there any questions here? No? OK, I'll, I'll go back to, to the Q&A questions. Um, I, I guess this is partially linked to um, to your point just now, Pierre, like, what, what are the most common types of disputes within the sports sectors that you guys have seen, either in Asia or elsewhere? I mean, are, are they usually um, sports law specific type issues, your anti-doping, your um, you know, player transfer type stuff, recruitment of young players, or, or, or do they tend to be more commercial issues which have arisen in the context of you know, sporting organizations like, I don't know, um, sponsorship rights disputes, uh, you know, disputes over the, co the construction of stadiums, stuff like that. What, what are the types of cases that you guys have seen so far? Uh, now, uh, CAS, of course, is really specific. CAS has an uh, ordinary, uh, ordinary division, so can deal with, uh, uh, with uh, we say, normal commercial disputes with sports-related uh, background. Um, uh, but it's not, of course, the, the, the big success of the CAS, and there are not many, many cases that are brought to CAS uh, uh, on this basis. Usually, uh, parties have an ICC arbitration clause or LCA arbitration clause, CIAC arbitration clause, but now are not going to, uh, to CAS. Um, CAS is really the, the success of CAS is the appeals against uh, the decision of federation association in different fields. As you said, it's of course uh, and dop and doping cases are uh, uh, growing a lot. Um, uh, and as uh, Go said also, uh, the jurisprudence, yeah, this decision from the FIFA uh, judicial bodies. Because uh, as it goes, there are like a system um, uh, protecting clubs uh, and players and, and, and football football players. Uh, if um, a club decide to uh, to uh, to terminate an arbitrary contract, um, there is a choice uh, in the statute in the FIFA statute saying that you can go before you can bring your case before the state courts because, as in France, the the, 
the 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 the, national, the, the laws French was really protective for for uh, for uh, workers and for football players. But you have in some other countries who have not such kind of, of protection, and uh, the international uh, rules of FIFA. Um, can be used in order to uh, obtain compensation or sanctions for both clubs or, 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 or players if they uh, terminate the contract. So many, many cases brought um, uh, to, to CAS are uh, from uh, these FIFA legal bodies uh, who are uh, sanctioning this kind of situation. And but go please. Yeah, I, I think I can just follow up on that is that I could comment that uh, actually FIFA and WADA are the two biggest feeder of CAS cases. So um, so after FIFA actually signs on to the, 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 the CAS um, and includes the CAS arbitration in their FIFA statute, which becomes a kind of a forced arbitration or mandatory arbitration for, for any professional football player clubs, then the, the caseload of CAS just, um, uh, you know, it's just significantly or dramatically uh, 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 increased. So that's something maybe commercial arbitration institution could learn from um, the, 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 the practice of, of CAS, just trying to get more cases. And in terms of the particularity in Asia, um, I do not see like um, there is a huge difference between um, uh, between Asia region or other part of region, just um, except that I think uh, for uh, real arbitration or commercial arbitration related to sport might not be that common here in Asia. So I think there is, um, because traditionally um, uh, professional sport, um, especially in China, is not very commercialized. So um, there is, um, so there, there haven't been like a culture of arbitration in, in Chinese sport, but right now we have amended sports laws, uh, which intends to create a Chinese version of CAS or Chinese version of uh, arbitration institution for sport. Um, so maybe that can um, drive the way forward um, see, to see more sports cases in, uh, in real arbitration. Um, and in my own experience, I think, um, you know, the typical cases are salary cases, especially in the current environment. You've got a lot of cases uh, trying to be lodged by the, by the football players against clubs. Um, so, so, so these are actually um, in nature an employment case, but because of the involvement of FIFA regulations, it's becoming more complicated, especially if you want, if you have to enforce your rights um, in a national court. Um, and for me personally, um, I recently also handled uh, disputes involving young players who are kind of trapped, trafficked, human trafficked by, by self-declared agents. Um, I, I, I just find that these cases are very emotional for me because um, um, the victim involved are a minor who, who are not very matured and uh, he's from an uneducated family. So his family or parents uh, couldn't really detect what is lie or who, who are really helping them and who are lying to them. And then um, in terms of this kind of uh, players transfer business, I just find it really bizarre because um, if it's, um, you know, if it's crosses border, it's really like international human trafficking because you, you got uh, uh, people or, or scum uh, who told the players that, okay, I can secure you a good future or I can help you realize your football dream in PSG, for example. And then they, this young player, he, he really wants to develop his career and he's uneducated. And uh, then, you know, um, so, so, so the case to me, uh, even though it's a football case, it's a football dispute, I have to uh, resolve these disputes between um, the self-declared, but actually I think it's criminals <laughs> and this young player and also, also the club. And uh, the case looks, um, actually looks to me, is more like a human trafficking case. So which becomes um, very emotional to me. So I can comment is that, um, you know, uh, representing the players is very different from representing corporates and, and even clubs or federation. Uh, I find that even, you know, um, I was assisting some players in their salary cases or employment cases, uh, even though these are just normal legal cases, 
but uh, because of the particularity of football profession, I find that their disputes is actually related, very, very um, relevant to their life, to their career, to their personal um, family. Um, so, so it's uh, always quite emotionally charged. And uh, so it's, uh, I think the, these are representing the players are actually um, the most complicated cases I've seen in my career. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I think uh, if you have the opportunity to enter into this field and uh, then you can get a feel about it. Okay, thanks guys. Um, I, I see that our time is more or less up. I, I do know that there are two more questions here, right? Um, and, and, and since this is you know, 2022, we have social media, I'm going to read out these questions um, and maybe you guys might want to take some time and just sort of answer them on Facebook, you know, maybe commenting in, on, on the YouTube video or on the Facebook link. So, so the last two questions, and again, please, you don't need to answer them now, are um, whether the FIFA related case included investment arbitration or commercial arbitration. Um, and, and, and I think this one's more to you, Guo. Do, do you think the decision of the Chinese court would have been different if FIFA player status committee had declined jurisdiction to adjudicate the dispute on the grounds that the club had been dissolved. In such a situation, would the appropriate recourse have been to, as per the arbitration clause, proceed to CAS? So again, you don't need to answer that now. Maybe it takes some time to think about it. Um, and, and Pierre, a bit of homework for you as well. Um, you know, when you're talking about the Pestein case, you're mentioning that um, the ECHR said that because uh, the obligation to go to arbitration was mandatory, um, it would be against, I think, Ms. Pestein's human rights if, it, if there was a lack of transparency. Um, I, I, my, my question is, do, does this Pestein case have implications outside of sports arbitration? For example, with, in the context of investment arbitration, where, where a party's only jurisdictional ground is to go, um, perhaps, you know, to, to, to use recourse to an investment treaty. Um, would, would the same considerations apply? And again, you know, the, the, these are just some sort of questions for you guys to answer. No, no need to do so now. Um, thank you very much to both of you. And I'm sorry for giving you this homework, but you know, that's, that's life, right? Um, so uh, as some final closing remarks for myself, thank you very much to, 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 to Guo, to Pierre, to, to Kent, to the team here at Hogan Lovells, um, to the team at the NUSCIL and also the ILA's uh, Singapore branch. Um, I really, really enjoyed this. I, I hope that you guys have as well. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. We'll see you for the, the next webinar. Bye bye. Thanks all. Bye. Thank you. Hi. Thank you very much, Anthony. Thank you, Kent. And a big thought to Kush uh, that he recovers quickly. Thanks, the organizer. Thanks, the audience. And uh, I will reply to the question on my linking. So, so Anthony, you can tell the, 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 the person who asked the question. I, I, will, I will duly answer them. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Gwo. Thank and you, thank you, Anthony. No worries. Thank you.